branch of history, Troy, as described by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, was considered to be a literary fantasy, a fictitious place. In 1876, however, Heinrich Schliemann, a wealthy German aristocrat obsessed with the Homerian epics, gazed at a face that had been concealed for millennia. As he held a Mycenaean funerary mask, he exclaimed, I have gazed on the face of Agamemnon, thus proclaiming the lore of the ancients to be rooted in historical fact. The so-called Mask of Agamemnon was not Schliemann's only discovery, however, although it is the most well-known. Largely credited with discovering the lost site of the Trojan War, the father of archaeology had excavated Hisarlik in modern-day Turkey just a few years prior. One of his most important finds was a hoard of objects he declared Priam's treasure. This cache has an extremely interesting and tumultuous history, which is still subject to controversial claims of ownership, repatriation, and collective cultural heritage. Treasure A, better known as Priam's treasure, is a corpus consisting of golden vessels, diadems, and other jewelry. It was unearthed in 1873 by Schliemann himself. He writes that his attention was attracted by a shimmering form in the fortification wall, becoming all the more interested as he thought he saw gold glimmering. Schliemann called Epidos in order to withdraw the treasure from the greed of my workmen and cut the objects from the excavation wall himself. With the help of Frederick Calvert, Schliemann smuggled the objects from the archaeological site to his home in Athens. This was in direct violation of his agreements with the Ottoman government, which specified that half of his fines belonged to the state and would be surrendered to the proper authorities. After a scandal broke out and a Turkish lawsuit ensued, Schliemann attempted to bribe the Greek Supreme Court into ruling in his favor, declaring that he had made them the heirs of Priam's treasure while continuing to negotiate its sale to both London and Paris. Both the Greeks and the Ottomans were understandably displeased. Schliemann finally attempted to negotiate peace with the Turkish government. He would pay double the court-ordered fine for stealing the artifacts and an additional sum to pay 150 workers for excavation label, a total of 50,000 francs. In return, he would retain archeological rights to continue his studies at Troy. Justifiably unamused, the Turks took Schliemann's money but did not give Schliemann further excavation rights. Upon his death in December of 1890, Schliemann left the Trojan treasures to the German people, and they were housed in the Ethnographic Museums of Berlin. Berlin, of course, suffered massive damages and was looted by the Red Army in 1945 during Russian occupation of Germany in World War II. Although the Russian government officially denied any knowledge of the cash, the Minister of Culture, Yevgeny Sidorov, revealed in 1993 that he had held these dull gold vessels. Despite these cycles of theft, the majority of Priam's treasure is still housed in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow, where it is on display today. Many historians are fascinated with Schliemann as a self-made man, an idea that Schliemann himself propagated during his own lifetime. It wasn't until 1979 that historians began to question his character, authenticity, and contributions. Even then, Schliemann was indisputably praised as having a permanent place of honor in the history of scholarship. Scholar David Trail has been one of Schliemann's most important detractors, writing countless articles and several books on the myth, scandal, and deceit that Schliemann proliferated. Even studies claiming to focus on Priam's treasure do so primarily through a biographical lens, chiefly examining the circumstances of their discovery and the subsequent lawsuits. This, however, is partially due to the fact that until 1993, it was believed that the artifacts had been permanently lost or destroyed during World War II. This does not, however, explain the gap in research that continues today. No scholars have sought to frame Priam's treasure in a theoretical context, examining the history of the objects beyond Schliemann's biography and their proposed archaeological context. The fact remains that these objects represent a unique place in cultural heritage that elicits the question, what should be done with Priam's treasure? Reformations in the museum world and art market have been drastic since the UNESCO Convention of 1970 first attempted to regulate the sale and export of antiquities, especially that which is regarded as cultural heritage. Repatriation, or the return of an artwork to its place of origin, has been one of the most controversial call to arms. Some scholars, such as Salam al-Kintar, see repatriation as a historical act of justice, 
part of the compensation for the many horrific acts committed during the age of colonialism. Therefore, it should be embraced by both the perpetrators and the victims as a symbolic act that recognizes the historical violation of cultural rights. James Kuna represents the other side of the argument. He maintains that encyclopedic museums, which house a wide variety of artistic mediums, periods, and cultures, encourage the development of mutually beneficial relationships and represent pluralism, diversity, and the idea that culture shouldn't stop at borders. He also argues that while UNESCO has helped halt illegal trade and led to some rightful instances of repatriation, it has also inspired governments to make dubious claims for reparations, especially when current museums hold legitimate legal right to the artifacts in their collections. He uses the example of French excavations of Susa. In this case, the French had prearranged agreement with the Persian government that they got to keep any fines, so long as they were compensated for precious metals. Kuno further argues that far-reaching claims are perpetrated by governments that present culture as standing still rather than being in a constant flux, in order to use cultural objects to promote their own state's national identities as based in since-fallen powerful regimes. By modern laws, there are statute of limitations for claiming theft. That is, after a certain period of time, the owner has a right to a stolen object that they legally purchased. Therefore, it is possible in virtually any case that museums can legally claim the materials which have been taken by force, unequal treaty, by theft, or by deception. It is, however, important to realize that many countries were, at the time of the object's removal, in no position to resist the original removal of antiquities for colonial or for other reasons. In all cases, scholars generally agree that calls for repatriation or restitution should be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. When multiple countries call for repatriation, however, the case becomes decidedly more complicated. I will carefully examine Priam's treasure through object biography, focusing especially on the social, cultural, and political context of each country's claim to these Trojan artifacts. I argue that due to the complex nature of the claims of ownership over Priam's treasure, the answer of what to do with these objects is not a simple one. In this case, repatriation is not an appropriate answer, and the case instead points towards a collective stewardship. In light of the fact that Priam's treasure is currently housed and is on display at the Pushkin Museum in Moscow, Russia, it is logical to start first with their claims to the collection. It should be noted that there are ongoing official negotiations between Germany and Russia regarding the mutual theft of cultural treasures from one another during the Second World War. Russia has stated that the Trojan gold is part of these negotiations, which are confidential. However, the Russian Federation continues to maintain that following Adolf Hitler's suicide in 1945, Germany was, effectively, without a government. Therefore, the USSR, as a legitimate governing authority in the occupation zone, had a legal right to remove the cultural property. This argument is closely tied to Russia's cultural identity as the victors of World War II arguing that, as such, they maintain a right to all the relocated cultural treasures in their possession, including Priam's treasure. In fact, there is public outcry regarding President Yeltsin's negotiation for the return of the collection to Germany, as Russian nationalists insisted that the loot was to pay for the massive loss of life and as reparations for Nazi war crimes. Furthermore, it is not insignificant that Heinrich Schliemann first offered to sell Priam's treasure to Russia, stating in a personal letter, for I love Russia above all other countries. This fact, of course, has not been lost on the Russians. Perhaps most importantly, the Russians have also made clear that they view the treasure as having actual cultural importance and significance to Russia itself, stating that the collection has great value in the study of early Russian art. Official documents state that Russian scholars have established not only a certain similarity between Priam's treasure and some categories of objects in the South Russian origin, but objects in the central regions of the Union that are close to the Trojan ones. The question remains, however, whether or not these claims outweigh the fact that the Red Army stole the artifacts when they looted Berlin, subsequently denying any knowledge of their survival and whereabouts, while hiding them in a closet of the Pushkin Museum's tour guide office. Moreover, some historians argue that any property looted from the Tiergarten Zutflak Tower could not be claimed by the Soviets, as later divisions would place the fortification firmly in Britain's legitimate zone.
If, then, the Russians should not have claim to the Trojan Horde, should the objects be returned to Germany? The most compelling argument for German claim is that Heinrich Schliemann specified in his final will his intents for the collection. He left his entire collection of Trojan artifacts, including Priam's treasure, as a gift to the German people for their permanent possession in an alienable safekeeping at the capital. Before his death, Schliemann was engaged with numerous negotiations with several different countries. His discussions with German officials bequeathed the collection to Germany, quote, on the condition that the rooms where it was exhibited be attractive and suitable and forever bear my name, guaranteed in an act by the German parliament. It is evident that the Germans took the stipulation very seriously. Priam's treasure remained in Berlin for over 60 years, first at the Ethnographic Museum and then at the State Museum for Pre- and Early History. The Germans clearly held Priam's treasure in high regard. It was categorized as Class I, irreplaceable by the Nazis, who as early as 1934 took care to safeguard it with other national treasures. Even in mass chaos in the midst of bombing of Berlin in 1945, Hitler gave direct orders demanding that the carefully packaged crates be moved to safety. There is, of course, merit in the fact that Priam's treasure was stolen from their care during the Soviet occupation. As mentioned previously, there have been several treaties, negotiations, and agreements between Germany and the USSR, which began as early as 1957 and were especially prevalent throughout the 1990s. The efforts of these treatises have since been re-established by the Russian Federation. These agreements call for the mutual and reciprocal return of art treasures illegally taken away without monetary compensation for their return. It is true that there was a mutual looting between the two countries during both the Nazi invasion of Russia and the Berlin occupation by the Soviets. However, where the USSR seems to have systematically removed and hidden German treasures, the Nazis pillaged, stripped, and desecrated Soviet libraries, museums, houses, and even graves. By one account, mirrors were smashed or machine gunned, brocades and silks were ripped from the walls, and they took everything that they could pry loose, right down to the parquet floors. Therefore, while the Soviets had safely stored their bounty, keeping it, quote, well cared for under governmental protection, there is little to be returned to Russia. Most of the cultural material was kept by the individuals who stole it, sold by East Germans strapped for cash, or has already been returned by the Allied forces to Russia. Therefore, while Germany has proposed that both countries submit to a third party arbitration, there is little guarantee that either Germany or Russia could maintain the claim over the treasure. The Turks and the Greeks both have a stake in the game as well. On the surface, it seems obvious that Priam's treasure and the rest of the Trojan gold should be returned to Turkey, especially when considering the information presented above. In the usual call for repatriation, it fits the criteria. The finds were, after all, unearthed in Turkish soil. When one examines the evidence more closely, however, it becomes clear that the solution is not so cut and dry. As mentioned previously, the cache was discovered early morning on May 31, 1873, by midday, the Turkish overseer of the project had confronted Schliemann, demanding that he open immediately all of his chests. The German scholar, of course, promptly threw him out, and while the watchman went to get authority to search the house and secure reinforcements, Schliemann packed the treasure into six baskets and sent it with a trusted workman to be hidden at Frederick Calvert's farm. During the night on June 6, the baskets were smuggled onto a boat and then to Athens. The agreements between the Ottoman government and Schliemann stipulated that half of all the finds were to be sent to Constantinople as property of the state. As very little archaeological material had been relinquished, Schliemann had published many articles touting the exceedingly rich wealth of finds, and his wife had been photographed wearing Priam's treasure and circulated publicly, the Ottoman government brought a lawsuit against Schliemann in 1874, the trial to be held in Athens. After almost a year of proceedings, Schliemann was ordered to pay the Turks a 10,000 franc indemnity. It seems on the surface that Schliemann had lost. After all, he had to pay reparations to the Ottoman government. However, Schliemann offered to pay the Turks twice what was owed for their share, and an additional payment of 30,000 francs to finance his proposed future archaeological excavations. The Ottoman government terminated the lawsuit and accepted Schliemann's peace offering. It is here that the question of ownership becomes more complicated. 
While this fact is disputed, I argue for several reasons that the Ottoman government officially relinquished their right to Priam's treasure. Firstly, by the order of the Athenian court, Schliemann was ordered to pay compensation to the Turks, not to return the artifacts. In any case, the Ottomans terminated their lawsuit officially and accepted Schliemann's offer. If this is not enough evidence, the Ottomans eventually reinstated Schliemann's archaeological rights, although it is important to note that they did not initially do so, even though they took complete sum of 50,000 francs. Moreover, each subsequent excavation permit introduced increasingly strict division of excavated material. The last firman stipulated that all fines were to go to the state. It is obvious that Schliemann did not uphold these agreements, smuggling artifacts out of Turkey via Italian consuls, but nevertheless, the continued business relations between the Ottomans and Schliemann indicate that the Turks no longer felt wronged by Schliemann and felt sufficiently compensated, and they did not make further attempts to remove Priam's treasure from his care. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence that Turkey has abdicated their legal claim to the treasures comes from a report from 1995, where Turkey, Germany, and Russia were each asked to plead their case for claiming ownership. Turkey makes no mentions of the 1874 court case. They argue only for a reunification of the antiquities and their return to the excavation sites, so that the current archaeological activity of the site will benefit from their presence in close proximity to ongoing archaeological fieldwork. Lastly is the political framework. Schliemann's legal battle, business dealings, and excavation permits were agreements with the Ottoman Empire, not the Republic of Turkey. Historians Maxwell Anderson and James Kuno both discuss the controversies that arrive when modern nations lay claim to cultures of the past. Essentially, Turkey is claiming the heritage of the Ottoman Empire, primarily on the grounds that they occupy the same geographical area. Even if one accepts Turkey as the direct successor of the Ottomans, however, one question still remains. Does Turkey have cultural claim over Troy itself? The Homeric epics, what initially captivated the young Heinrich Schliemann, are widely recognized as Greek culture. Some of the most famous art in human history, the Greek red and black pottery, depict various scenes of the Iliad and the Odyssey, featuring Ajax, Achilles, Hector, and Patroclus. It could therefore be argued that Troy itself was culturally Greek. They worshipped the same gods, had similar burial practices, and share artistic practices with contemporary mainland Greece. Moreover, when the Ottoman court case seemed imminent in 1874, Schliemann proclaimed to the Athenians that he had made them heirs of Priam's treasure. Schliemann did, however, later disinherit them in his anger when Greece sided with the Ottoman government and refused to protect him from Ottoman legal pursuits. One seemingly crucial detail that the court case overlooked was the export of antiquities from both Turkey and Greece. The Ottoman government issued a decree in April 1872 that prohibited the export of antiquities, including any fines that Schliemann had legal claim to. This policy, however, seems to be a dead letter from the onset. It was not invoked in Schliemann's court case. Greece, however, did have a strictly enforced ruling forbidding the export of any antiquities, unless they had an official customs document proving that they had been imported beforehand. Seeing as Schliemann smuggled Priam's treasure into Greece, he had no such verification, and apparently was in the habit of being fraudulent in these declarations. It is established that Schliemann had a tendency to smuggle artifacts through his personal luggage, like treasures K and Q from the 1882 excavations. It is not beyond the realm of possibility, then, that Schliemann had to employ similar tactics to safely remove Priam's treasure from Greece in 1874. If this were the case, the argument could be made then that Priam's treasure should belong to Greece, especially in conjunction with the above information, even though Greece has never formally demanded the collection's return. In conclusion, the fate of Priam's treasure presents a problematic case, one where multiple countries are calling for repatriation from one another on various bases. This matter is further complicated when one realizes that, based on claims made by Turkey, Germany, and Russia, countries like Britain, France, and the United States could argue their own claims if they were compelled to do so. Although claims of world heritage and common culture are often used to perpetuate colonialist advantages and abdicate institutions from demands of restitution, in this case, these arguments may be valid. No one country can decidedly lay claim to Priam's treasure for only themselves. 
Instead, it should be viewed as a shared interest utilized to foster reciprocal and mutually beneficial relationships between museums and collections. In future research, it may be beneficial to explore the colonialist mindsets and European cultural values that inspired Schliemann to lay claims to the Trojan gold in the first place. Thank you for listening to my presentation.